uh, lecturer in Irish politics and society in the National University of Ireland in Maynooth and co-author of course the Second Republic of <coughs> Irish Politics after the Celtic Tiger. Mary also uh, continues to be an active advocate for social justice and equality and is a regular media contributor on such issues and if I'm not mistaken you were on the Bits and Brown show last night. Uh, also Yes, uh, Mary also is uh, on the Central Committee of Claiming Our Future and a member of the Advisory Council of Task Think Tank for Action on Social Change and Participation in Other Civic Society Initiatives. So uh, we're very fortunate to have Mary here as well as Michael. So would you put your hands together please and welcome. <coughs> a bit intimidated looking at the audience, I have a sense of I shouldn't be teaching grannies how to suck eggs, and I, 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 I kind of feel that many people could do better justice to the subject in hand than I. Um, but I suppose the overall theme being 90 years of the Irish state and sovereignty and democracy in the Republic, and I guess it couldn't be more apt in the times that we're in, but I suppose I'd always, a couple of my students in, in the audience, and I'd always say to my students that we've got to be really careful to define the kind of words that we're talking about and, and, and our meaning of them. And I'd say, you know, there's four key words in, in the, you know, the theme for, for this uh, year's Greaves Summer School. State, sovereignty, democracy and republic. And they all require maybe some definition and some pinning down as to what precisely we mean by them. Because in the context in which we use them changes all the time. Our understanding of what it is changes. And just as, you know, a, Michael there was describing globalisation as, as the new <coughs> imperialism, but the, the imperialist power isn't necessarily another state anymore. It's much more likely to be multinational corporations. So our understanding of what the nation state is and what the other power blocks in the world are is changing all the time. And I think we need to be very mindful of that when we're understanding words like sovereignty, democracy and republic, because they change in the context of globalization change and, and the degree to which it's really financial corporatist globalization that's the real imperialist power in the world right now. It's not necessarily even the power of any one state, no matter how great any imperialist state might think it might be. So I think all of those definitions are contestable and all of them are quite controversial. And for that reason, I just really want to take one, one theme from it. And that's the relevance of republicanism in signposts and the way to recovery right now, and recovery in its various forms, political, social and economic. And I want to draw out two kind of key themes in the paper. One, the degree to which republicanism and republican values can offer some sort of practical compass to budget strategies in trying to gear towards economic recovery. And the second, to what degree republican values can be of any use in looking at political reform and, and maybe in the context of a, a very weak constitutional convention that we're supposed to be having any day now. But before I do that, I, I want to um, rise to Michael's challenge where, where he says some left parties will, will ignore the, the challenge of discussing partition. Um, and I mean, in the book I, I wrote with Patrick Kirby, we, we did try and engage with the, the, the reality of partition and the degree to which there is a constitutional aspiration for consensual reunification on the island and whether or not the present context brings us any nearer that and, and to, lay, to lay out some of the arguments around that and you know to acknowledge it's very central to the, the theme of the Grieve Summer School. And as a starting point for that I suppose a lot of you would have read an article by Andy Pollock in the Irish Times this week where he was arguing that the issue of partition is increasingly a non-subject for, for Irish citizens or for Southern citizens at the very least arguing that you know, in and around 2000, at the time of the GFA, up to 54% were favouring unity, but a very conditional form of unity where there wasn't to be too high a price to be paid for that unity. And he quoted Peter Mayer, the, the late Peter Mayer, the political scientist, saying if people thought it was going to cost money or violence or even disrupt the social equilibrium that they had, then it mightn't be worth it. And he quoted then a recent 2011 survey of students in UCD that showed little practical enthusiasm for, for, for unity. I suppose what I was interested in, because there, there is a, a sense that with the referendum on Scottish devolution or independence in 2014, that we are getting a nearer a time where there will be a breakup of what we formerly knew of as the United Kingdom, and there will be much more spotlight 
on issues of devolution in the context of that. And inevitably, we are moving into a space with 2016 and that happening, where inevitably this discussion is going to get real and it's going to be on the cards. And for that reason, I just thought it would be interesting to bring in a, one aspect of that, which is the, the, the economic arguments around it. And myself and Padre in our book were raising questions about whether or not the crisis brought us any nearer to justifying economic arguments for ending partition, whether from a, a Northern Ireland state of perspective it made sense to draw out some of the economic rationale for an all-Ireland economy and that there were very strong reasons for trying to develop that and we see issues like the you know the the the, the evening out of the corporation tax on the island. We see that 20% of NAMAS properties are actually located in Northern Ireland. We see the likes of Bradley making very strong arguments, economic arguments for all Ireland reunification having an economic benefit for Ireland North and South. And whether or not the cross-border institutions that were set up under the Good Friday Agreement might have brought us any nearer that. But on the other hand, I think some really interesting data came out over this summer. I don't know whether it's out officially or not. But we hear an awful lot about the fiscal deficit of the South. We, we, we hear it, and um, we're very familiar with it. We know exactly how much it is to, to the pound, shilling and pence. But we don't hear that much about the fiscal deficit in the North. And to some degree, none exists because it's not seen as, as a national economy. But there are some estimates that have just come out now from Oxford Economics, who are doing some work for the, uh, the Office of the First and Deputy Minister in Northern Ireland. And, what they're arguing is they're trying to measure the regional fiscal deficit of Northern Ireland. So in other words, they're, they're literally trying to see how much Northern Ireland generates in tax uh, as an economy and how much it spends in public expenditure and to see what the deficit is or the relationship between the two. And they're arguing that it's in the region of 10 to 11 billion per year in terms of a deficit of, ex of you know, so the, the, the tax uh, makeup is... is 11 to 12 billion lower than the public expenditure. And that's about the cost to stage in the London Olympics, if, if, if we remember that. Um, but they're arguing, say, for example, so what Northern Ireland creates in taxation in its own economy every year will really only cover the health and the social protection bill of Northern Ireland. That would be about 3.5 billion and about 8 billion, respectively. So the rest will have to be made up for in some sort of transfer of resources. And that subvention would be about 30 to 40 percent of the Northern Ireland GDP at the moment. So it does raise a really serious question about a southern economy grappling with trying to bring down a fiscal deficit at the moment, losing sovereignty in the hands of the Troika, and the feasibility, the rationality, the political possibility of entering into any kind of negotiation that would imply a re-fiscal deficit once, once, once Ireland would come out of, of the Troika programme. So whilst it's very clear that that deficit is an outcome of colonialism and the underdevelopment of the Irish economy in, in the interests of the, you know, the, the broader needs of the British economy, that's, you know, that, that's an argument that we can make and, and sure enough, but at the same time it's very clear as well that the, the real economic cost of ending partition is something that we can't sweep under the table and not discuss. It's not to make an argument not to do it, it's to make an argument to say, look, at, this would be a very interesting debate to have. Because to some degree we can see that the political institutions of the Good Friday Agreement may bring us nearer the ending of partition or indeed they may consolidate actually the border as it is and there's a very interesting academic debate about which they are doing whether or not they're laying the foundations of ending partition or whether they're actually you know cementing the, the institutional makeup as it presently is whether you'll have creeping unification or, or, or whether you're, you're really um, consolidating what you have but I think the economic arguments are um, are interesting. So I suppose whilst Irish republicanism has, has to some degree been, been dominated by those debates about the constitutional form of Ireland and, and the issues of independence and self-determination and you know partition itself and the national question, what I really want, want to turn from, from most of what I'm looking at now is to really how some of the other key tenets of republicanism and the values that are implied in republican theory um, have some relevance to the the context we find ourselves in now, north and south, but I'm particularly going to concentrate on, on, on the south. Um, and I suppose 
what, what I'm particularly interested in and what I've tried to do in some of the work in, in, in the book I wrote with Padder was to see how Republican values could bring us into a different kind of debate about social and economic policy and, and about political reform. Um, and that's really to argue that Republican values, if they're aired and used properly, can allow us to draw out the social dimension of some of the key national questions that we need to discuss. They draw attention to the very concept of equality that's at the very heart of Republican theory and they particularly draw attention to the concept of the public in the, in the res public. And the, the, the very idea that a republic is actually based on the idea that we share interdependent needs and that we agree to have common goods between us, that we value public goods and public spaces. And I think, I mean, the long history of the Irish state, and, and Michael drew, drew attention to the programme at the beginning and, and the absence of any fulfilling in it, but we know the history of Irish social and economic policy, that Ireland failed miserably in any attempt to engage with the concept of public goods. And I think, you know, our approach to public expenditure was characterised as fiscal anorexia. And I think it's a, it's a very, very good, like just a, a complete aversion to the concept of spending money on the common good, of taxing citizens in order to create a common good and a public sphere between us. And whilst it was like that, I think, all the way from the very foundations of the Irish state, I think since the 1980s, it's been coupled with a neoliberal ideology that has reinforced that aversion to public expenditure. So we've looked to the private, to the market, for things like education, housing, health, um, and other kinds of public goods that could have been provided by the state. So we've increasingly commodified things that should have been within the common good and the public space. And I think if republicanism could be of value to us now, I think some of the values of republicanism in terms of proclaiming the virtue of the public could be used very well to defend public services, to defend the idea of separating out public sector unions from private sector unions and trying to divide citizens <coughs> on those kind of, you know, I think republicanism it gives us a lot of very useful language where you can assert the value of the public service a little bit more. I think a second value that it gives is that, that concept of the individual being free and the absence of domination in one's life. And that implies that citizens have some sort of equality of power in their lives. And I think this is really, really important now. Michael talked about work for all as, as a key right that people needed. But the degree to which a lot of our policy is framed <coughs> by Anglo-Saxon and, and neoliberal kind of values and the area where I do most of my academic work is on welfare reform. And I think we're, we're getting into a very worrying space now where individual right to work, to freely chosen work, is going to be very demarcated by an increasing attack on people's right to welfare, an increasing focus on mandatory work, on conditionality in return for your welfare, where people will be forced by the state to take what often will be very low quality jobs on, on, on threat of losing their welfare. And I think, again, Republican values can, can be of great meaning here because whilst every state has to have a welfare state, it has to engage in how you run your welfare state. We see that there are Nordic values that are closer to Republican values that have managed to design welfare policies that enable their citizens move more freely between welfare and work in a better quality environment and with better quality jobs. We're very much taking the low road to all of this, the Anglo-Saxon road, where our, our labour market policy and our welfare policy are orientated to the needs or the wants of employers rather than the needs and the wishes of citizens. And I do think that Republican values, and particularly the value of freedom, the need for the absence of domination in your life, can be drawn on to make very strong arguments for a more Nordic-style welfare state that enables people to be free. I think the other area where, where we can see a, the, the interdependency of human beings being a really <coughs> fundamental value of Republican theory is very important in the idea of a common good. And Ireland has been called by, by Kathleen Lynch and, and others a careless state, a state that has done very, very little to acknowledge the need to support our interdependency and to support the development of care services for our children, for our older people, again, as, as Michael read out in the original declaration. I think the recession has been very much used as, as a, a sort of an opportunity to really downgrade a lot of the, the arguments that maybe had been won a little bit around the need for care and for services and for a decent kind of health system and, and the likes. So 
whatever progress we had made on things like gender equality, I think, is really under serious threat now in, in being run.